Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. So I picked up this monster today. It's a Lambda LK301-FM adjustable power supply, which, uh, let's see, at uh, an ambient temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, it is able to deliver 25 amps, and the output is adjustable from 0 to 36 volts has the two analog meters and uh, the dual adjustment knobs. Well, actually, they're coaxial knobs. The, the back part adjusts the coarse voltage or current, and the front part is like a fine tune. It sits in a 19-inch rack cabinet. It is dirtier than hell, and uh, has these heavy-duty rack rails on the side. And if we look at the back, we can see that somebody went to town on cutting wires off because they didn't know what they're good for. Now that AC cord is still connected, non-grounded. Uh, non and it has a helpful diagram on the back of what the outputs do. I found this in the local ads. It was advertised as non-working or I plugged it in and nothing happened type of thing. And uh, the asking price was a total of $10. So I thought, hey, let me get this thing. And I'm putting it on video right off the bat because uh, usually I fuss with these things and clean them up before I sink my hands into them. But I wanted everybody to be able to see uh, what, these, what it looked like uh, fresh out of the uh, seller's shed. Now, this was a funny story because he had also advertised it as uh, careful, this thing weighs 30 plus pounds. So I'm lifting this thing, or trying to deadlift it from the floor in a shed, and uh, at first, expecting something above 30 pounds, which usually to me means 35 pounds or so, and the thing wouldn't move. So finally, I put my back into it and uh, gave it a heavy tug. Probably destroyed my lower back, but uh, yeah, the thing weighed more than 30 pounds. So when I got it home, the first thing I did was I put it on a scale, on a bathroom scale, and this thing weighs in at 92 and a half pounds. So what a deal. I paid a penny and something per pound on this beautiful piece of test instrumentation. Before attempting to power this thing up, it would probably be a prudent thing to do to open up the top and see if we can see anything untoward. And then it's going to need a new power cord because uh, this one's definitely seen better days. And, but let's see what awaits us. Yes, the excitement is killing me too. And finally, it looks like I am going to have to break the uh, calibration seal. So where is it? Somewhere down here. There it is. Calibration seal broken. Open sesame. All right. Uh, Something just fell out. Probably a washer or something. But let's see if. Uh... So there's our little diagram. Shows the uh, two massive transformers, which unfortunately have uh, are showing some. Uh, rust around the laminates, which is not a good thing. And uh, let's see, I, uh, I should probably take the camera off the tripod and show you some of the uh, massive components used in here. No shortage of transformers in here. Also no shortage of large capacitors. 
and uh, there's a fuse. I don't know if you can see that right there. More capacitors. So there's a total of what six capacitors in here. And uh, where are all of the fuses? Is that the only fuse in there? Because see in the back, it doesn't look like there's fuses in there. Hmm. So that's where the AC comes in. Well, let's have a look at the main fuse down there and see what that has to say. Okay, so before I'm going to stick my fingers in there to remove that fuse, first of all we will make sure that the frayed power cord is in fact unplugged. And then we're going to use this little CRT discharge probe that I, you think you, I think you may have seen me use it before to discharge all of these capacitors. And we simply clip onto one side and touch the other side. No sparking, no fireworks, but we got to perform this seemingly boring deed. Better bored than dead, right? And it looks like We are in fact discharged, no sparks, no crackles. Okay. Well, let's check the most obvious, which is of course the fuse. I don't like this part, but oh well. So what we have is a bus class G fuse rated at 300 volts and 30 amps. So let's see what our meter has to say. Well that may not be smart because it may be shorting against the uh, cooling fins here. So. Let's put them here. And see what Mr. Meter has to say. And Mr. Meter says Fuse is good. So uh, I guess we need to start checking. Well, let's see if the power cord actually is defective. First of all, of course, let's see if anything is shorting in the power cord. No, the meter is quiet. And let's see power cord prongs are actually connected to the input terminals at least. Okay, that's connected to the top one. And this one is connected to the bottom one. Well, I guess I gotta put the stupid fuse back in. (laughs) 
Oh, come on, man, I'll put the damn fuse back in. All right, it's in. So I guess, uh, well, let's clean up the back a little bit. All those cut wires are. And uh, install a new cord. So I removed all the wiring from the rear connections panel and it's in the pile over here. Everything was cut except there's one jumper over here. But uh, of course I removed it and I don't remember where it was connected to. Uh, maybe I'll go and review the footage and see what that was connected to. But uh, generally this makes sense when comparing it to the uh, diagram over here. We have the main DC plus and DC minus outputs. And then going from the bottom, we have AC in, the two AC ins, S minus, which I'm guessing is the minus sense input, ground, which by the way is not connected to the chassis. So this is an internal ground isolated from the chassis, positive sensing, and uh, PO, which I think means parallel operation. So if you're hooking up two or more of these in parallel uh, to get uh, uh, to get more current, then uh, you're using this this terminal. Again, they refer to this being wired, uh, how it is wired. But of course, the uh, the diagram isn't there. Now, if you remember, we had uh, this frayed end here. It was. It looked frayed, but th there was no shorts, and I, I, I measured it, and everything seemed okay, but when I removed it from the AC terminals, we can see that the wires are not just frayed, they are actually stripped. There's, uh, there's copper showing through on both ends. So uh, if this was, if you plug this in while these were connected, it would probably have blown a fuse almost immediately. So what I'm going to do is essentially hook up, get a new power cord, and uh, and see if we can get this thing to power up. I made a temporary AC connection with these two alligator clips coming from a power cord. Uh, don't try this at home, boys and girls. It's dangerous. And just to verify, the way this was pre-wired is that the positive DC output is wired to the positive sense input. And the negative DC output is, of course, wired to the negative sense input. But it is also wired to the terminal marked ground. And uh, in the documentation I read, that is the recommended setup for if you're using a, a non-negative ground. So that's all set up in there. And uh, so I got it plugged in to the uh, auto transformer. And uh, let's bring this up and see if anything works. So let's see what does that meter say. It's a bit hard to read. Ah, it says about 110. So let's let this sit at 110. Nothing blew up. No overcurrent tripped anything. And uh, let's see what does the current reading say. Well, the current reading says nothing because uh, we are plugged. We're not plugged into it. But the analog meter says about an amp, and that's not good. So if we come back here and uh, let's connect the meter to the output terminals, minus, and plus. 
and the output immediately jumps to 46 volts. Now I'm going to adjust the voltage to minimum. It's already at minimum. I cannot affect the voltage from the front panel. So something is definitely amiss in here, but at least it turned on. So let's have a look at this whole mess from the front. So here we are looking at the front. Uh, also note that I did not hook up the AC neutral wire either to ground or the chassis because it's unclear to me. I mean most likely that will need to be hooked up to the chassis but uh, I'm going to need to get some more documentation before I go ahead with that. But here we are. The voltage is set all the way to minimum. Current also but let's give it a little bit of current because this basically limits the current and might shut this thing off. So we have the current set. Oh, it's hard to tell. Probably an amp here. And the voltage is at zero. So now when we turn it on, boom. The voltage meter pegs to max immediately. Remember we saw uh, 46 volts on the meter that I had hooked up to the back. So this kind of corresponds with it and it says that there's no current coming out. And when I look at the um, auto, at the auto try the variac, it is telling me that it's drawing about half an amp without doing anything. Now I played with this when we had the meter in the back and we can not affect anything. Can't bring the voltage down and bringing the current up or down doesn't make a difference because this is telling us there's no current flowing through the output even though there is current flowing somewhere because the variac says uh, we're, uh, we are uh, under an amp but we are supplying current so something in here is defective and it's eating up it's eating up current and it is obviously not regulating the voltage so now we'll probably, as the caps discharge, we can see the voltage go down. And I checked all of the caps. The DC voltage on all of the caps was basically 46 volts. So yeah, something's not working. And uh, that brings our current investigation to a screeching halt because without schematics for this thing, uh, I can't really continue. So let me go and check some more for schematics and uh, maybe even contact Lambda directly and see if they're kind enough to provide me with something if they still have it. And once I have the extra information, then we will continue. Well, a few days have passed and I'm back. And the reason I'm back is I did get the required documentation. This was actually very interesting because I emailed the Lambda Tech Support and asked them if they had any documentation for this guy. And I got an email back the next morning that said, uh, could you please sign the attached agreement and then we'll send you the manual. And I thought it was going to be an NDA, but uh, it was a hold harmless agreement, which basically, I've never seen one of those before, but it says something to the effect that if uh, by using this information we provide to you, you electrocute yourself, uh, you can't hold us responsible. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, well, what do you think? I'm going to get the manual and then uh, touch the wrong things and then hold you responsible, uh, Lambda? Well, anyway, uh, I uh, signed it, sent it back, and a couple hours later I had a full copy of the uh, owner's manual for this. And in those days the owner manual actually meant not just owner information, but there was a technical analysis, troubleshooting charts, and full schematics in there. And I don't know if I told you, I found a version of this document online previously, but uh, somebody had gone through and deleted like half the pages, such as schematics, theory of operation, and stuff like that. So that manual was just wet my appetite, but I couldn't do anything with it. But uh, I now have the full manual, and uh, so it's time to tear into this guy. So one of my first worries was, I mean, look at this thing, you know, how 
Yeah, I can get to the capacitors easy, as you saw before, but how do I get to all the components? And it turns out that this thing's actually really service friendly. Three screws out of the uh, heat uh, sink, and the whole back lifts out, or swings out, I should say. And you know, I have full access to the pass transistors in the back and other assorted circuitry. And uh, there's a diode that I showed you briefly as a teaser, I think, in a previous video. And uh, then, of course, you know, I have to get into the front too, but that also turned out to be quite easy. So here's the front panel, and uh, it turns out there are eight screws holding the front panel in place. And uh, when you take those eight screws out, the whole thing just comes out, and there's even still barely enough uh, barely enough uh, wire length to get it out of the way and you see the controls from the front panel and then there are the control boards or the brains of the whole thing that drive the series pass transistors in the back depending on how the dials are set in front and uh, the boards look really clean but I'm probably going to take them out and uh, do a visual inspection first look for obvious things. Uh, I had a previous video on doing an HP spectrum analyzer and on that one I kind of lucked out because I found capacitors which were kind of similar to those and one of those was shorted and basically when I replaced that the HP uh, analyzer came back to life and didn't really need anything else. So I'm kind of hoping to run into a similar situation here. So I'm going to check capacitors, uh, transistors, zener diodes. There is a uh, thermal switch over here. And uh, I guess that just monitors the ambient temperature inside the uh, cabinet. And see if all of those are... Well, obviously the thermal switch is okay because it came on. The thermal switch would shut it all off. but uh, Let's see which one of these components is uh, giving us trouble. I checked all, the, all of the capacitors and uh, they were... I mean about 90% of them showed good in circuit and the remaining 10% I lifted one of the leads out and then retested them and uh, they showed good which of course doesn't mean a whole lot on an instrument this age but uh, seemed good enough for that time so uh, I switched over checked some of the uh, transistors in there and they all looked okay so the next thing I did was I checked diodes the regular diodes were okay but then I found a suspicious Zener diode and if we look at the schematic, well, basically this is the uh, series regulator control part. It's got AC coming in through these two lines, and this part essentially is the uh, regulator for the series regulator control part of the circuit. And uh, this Zener diode over here, which is uh, an FBM Z104, which I've never heard of, was bad. It was bad in circuit. I took it out. It was completely open. And so... So now I have to find out where do I get an FBM Z104. And some were available on eBay, but they were surprisingly expensive. So I did a little bit of a search, and I was able to get a cross-reference to an NTE part, and it turns out that that is a 6.2 volt 1 watt Zener diode. So, uh, I actually had some of those, and uh, if we come back here, we can see the offender. Where'd the offender go? Oh, it's right here. I swapped them out, and let's see what that's going to buy us. Stay. So, drum roll. can't do this without obscuring it. But hey, didn't change. The voltage is still pegged at max. Well, 
I guess I need to continue. I continued checking uh, the uh, Zener diodes and uh, found another bad one. Right over here, this thing was also completely open and it's the exact same type that I replaced before, the FBM Z104. Looks like they got a bad batch of those because this one was also open on both sides and uh, so what I did, I started looking for any other occurrences of that same Zener diode in this circuit because it looks like they got a bad batch, but I couldn't find any more. So I replaced that one, and uh, the results were no change. It still wasn't working. The voltage was still pegging out at max. So finally what I did was I decided to read... They have a short troubleshooting guide in the, in the manual, and it says if you can't adjust the voltage, then it's probably... you have a problem with the uh, potentiometers in front, and uh, go ahead and check those and replace as necessary. And if you look at this, it's basically a module of two parts. It's a variable resistor. And as far as the externals are concerned, there's uh, two... there's one terminal here and another terminal here. And they're just wired so that you have a fine adjustment with a smaller resistor and a coarse adjustment with a larger resistor. So I, I guess I went in and I did the obvious, and the funny thing was that when I measured the two input terminals, the resistance between the two input terminals, there was no resistance. There was a dead short. Well, what do we have here? Two bad resistors? And I, I played, I turned the dials and, and, and nothing happened. So then I did a, a, a very close optical inspection of the uh, of the two uh, potentiometers, and I found something really interesting. So here's the two stack potentiometers, and at first everything looked okay because it's got the internal connections, it's got the two tabs, the two left side tabs on each part, has a solid wire connecting them. But then all of a sudden I noticed that somebody had come and added an extra wire that connected all of the three tabs in the, in the top uh, potentiometer together and the same thing on the bottom. There was a piece of wire lying across the three tabs and that would explain why it was just coming back as a short because I was essentially reading the resistance of a connecting wire. Why would they do that? I don't know, but uh, looking at the schematics, that means uh, the pot is actually directly connected to the negative sense input. And I guess if you short this guy out, uh, then you can put some sort of external pots on here between, uh, between the ground of the load and the uh, negative sense input and adjust things maybe automatically, maybe inject the control voltage or whatever. But this is kind of a interesting way to defeat this pot. I mean, you should have just removed the two wires that come out and tied them together so you could undo it later on, but that's not what was done. And why do I think it's uh, it was done later? And that's because, see, there's this harness going here, but this one wire, for some reason, has been pulled out of the harness and wrapped around this tab over here. So that looked very suspicious to me because this wire should really... well, I can't dig it out with one hand, but it should be part... it should be inside this harness, and somehow I guess that became undone and somebody put wires on it to short the... Uh, to short the terminals, and... Uh, and I guess after he soldered it, he went, oops, there's a wire that went amiss, but who cares, let's leave it there. So what I did was... Uh, what I consider the extra connections, which are from this tab to this tab and underneath it from the same tab to the next tab, I cut those and then I measured the resistance and now it started to work. The, the pots were okay. They need a little bit of uh, greasing, but other than that, they're okay. So of course I got excited about all of this and I put it back, I turned it on, and nothing had changed. 
yet again. So it was time to dwell, to dwell back into the schematics and see what I missed. I, I just kind of had this gut feeling I was close. And yes, I found another good one, but uh, I have to take responsibility for this because uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I had something to do with this, and this might be the uh, last piece of the puzzle. But if we look at this pot, and we can see that one end of it goes up into the voltage error amplifier. It has a voltage reference, and uh, then it actually tests the uh, minus sense input, compares the two, and no, it actually uses the minus sense input as a uh, ground reference for this pot pair. And then you go through all this rigmarole here. This is an interesting chip, by the way. It's a six-pin uh, metal can with an a with an NPN and a PNP transistor mounted inside. It's used as a comparator. Good luck finding one of those. I did take them out and measure them and they were the transistors were fine in there. But what about the other end? So it goes up here, jogs over here, come on, and it ends up at the minus sense input. And a dotted line here shows the minus sense input and the mine and the negative DC output are jumpered. And that's when it hit me. Remember all those wires I removed from the back? And there was one good jumper in there and I said I couldn't remember where that was from? Well, I guess I figured out where that was from. It's because if we look at the positive side, where DC, uh, positive DC output and the positive sense input. Oh, I'm showing the wrong ones. I mean, uh, the positive sense input and the positive DC output show a dotted line and them being connected together. And they were connected through the tabs on the back. But uh, the negative ones. I guess we're connected by that one jumper I removed. And when I measured them now, there was no connection. So the misleading part was that the uh, positive side sense and output were connected without jumpers, external jumpers. But uh, the negative side and the negative sense input weren't connected. So with that in mind, I went in. And you can see the white wire, which basically uh, the white wire with the red uh, sleeve on it, going from the negative sense input to the negative DC output terminal. All right. So uh, this is what the fourth drum roll of the night. Let's turn the voltage down. Let's turn the current down just a little bit and give us some light. Drum roll. Hello. What did I do? Did I turn off the power strip? Yes. I'm such a safety nut. Okay, again. It's on. And we can now adjust the voltage. That is so cool. And it goes up to about 36. Of course, there's no current because there's no load connected to the back. But here's the course adjustment. And see, it takes a while for it to come down because there's no load and the caps have to discharge on their own. But we'll bring it back up again. Turn the fine control, and we can see small meter movement. So it looks like it's working now. But this is probably a great opportunity to try out a piece of test equipment I got a while back, and I never had a chance 
to actually put through its paces. I think the best way to test the Lambda is to use an electronic DC load. And I happen to have this BK Precision 8540 150 watt DC electronic load that I've had for a while. I tested it briefly with some of the HP lab supplies I had. But I think that we can do a more uh, complete testing of the B and K. I mean, I bought it used, so no warranties. And uh, it seemed to work fine with the HP supplies, but I think this will test it much more fully. However, I've decided to make a uh, separate video because that's really a, a subject of its own on how to use an electronic load. And that would probably be done posted very shortly after the uh, Lambda video is posted. So again, I hope you liked it. I hope you learned a little bit. I, I sure learned a lot about series pass transistor power supplies. I mean, it's basically a humongous linear power supply that's adjustable with uh, overcurrent protection. It's a nice instrument. Probably not something I use on a day-to-day -day basis, but you never know. Powering up some old computer equipment, I may need 25 amps at 5 volts uh, to power that stuff, and it would come in real useful for that. Well, if you like this, Make sure to leave a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see uh, how that DC load works, because that's going to be the next video coming out. And uh, enjoy uh, the rest of your day, and hopefully we'll see you all soon in a few days. Oh, it's so smooth.